Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I am Kimberly from the Country Bookshop in Southern Pines. Um, as those of you joining us live are signing on, uh, I will introduce the bookshop and then um, Kirthana, and we will begin our chat. Um, the Country Bookshop is a general bookstore in Southern Pines, North Carolina. We're a little unique in that we're owned by our local community newspaper, um, and that we're just in a good old fashioned town, great Christmas shopping town. And we are here to give you recommendations. We can help you over the phone, over Instagram, whatever you need. We are here to serve you. Um, I will include links to buy this phenomenal book um, in the chat and also to listen to it on Libro FM, which is something we'll, we'll talk about as we get into our chat. Um, this book, I'm so excited to chat about this today. I've been excited about it since I read the first page. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the talented Kirthana Ramasetti. She is the author of Dava Shastri's Last Day. She has worked in media for over 10 years before she began to, to write fiction. She received her MFA in creative writing from Emerson College. She's a pop culture addict who lives in New York City, and we know we might hear some sirens if you're chatting with us from New York City today. Um, her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, New York Daily News, Newsday, The Atlantic, Entertainment Weekly, Today.com, and more. This book is out today and is already receiving top accolades. So welcome and happy book birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I, I am as well. Well, let's just start with, uh, if you could give us a few sentences about your book before we deep dive into it. Sure. So Dava Shastri's Last Day is about a philanthropist who, after learning she has a terminal illness, decides to do something very drastic. She gathers her family together for the holidays and lets them know that A, she has a terminal illness and she has gathered them together so she can say goodbye before a doctor helps her take her own life. And then B, uh, she leaked news of her death early. <laughs> So she can read her obituaries. So her family is horrified, but then Daba is horrified when her plan backfires and her two biggest secrets are revealed to the world, changing the perception of her legacy, or, or what at least she hoped would be said about her. So with the limited time she has left, she has to make amends with her children and also come to terms with the decisions she has made throughout her life. You know, it's fascinating because the whole book you know, takes place over a few days, but the way you use the plot and memories and, and narrative, you, you tell such a full life, not just a person's life, but the life of the whole family. And I wanted um, to you to talk a little bit just about your thoughts on, on narrative and the stories we tell and, and the family narrative that e is unique to each family um, and what your thinking is on that as you were writing the book. Sure, so it's funny for me personally because I actually learned something in writing this book. So when I first started writing this novel, it was largely about, let me write about the stuff that's interesting to me. So pop culture, celebrity, celebrity gossip, music, media, legacy. But ultimately, it's a family story and it's a family saga. So one of the things I learned while writing this is how much our families are important to us and how little we might not actually know about our families. You know, we think we have this idea of who our parents are or who our siblings are. But then unless you delve in and really ask the questions and try to get to know them, you're not really, you can't really know for sure. And so much of who we are are shaped by our previous generations, sometimes in ways we can't fully understand. And as I was crafting this novel, I could see Dava's impact on her children and then her grandchildren. And that was a lesson for me too, in terms of how generations can impact each other. So that was really cool for me. Well, even your acknowledgement, it's not just for your parents, it's for your parents and their parents. And I, I, I love, I, it, <laughs> even before you start reading, you get the sense of, mm -hmm. of your feeling on that interconnectedness. Um, you know, you also, use music to tell the stories of memories and, and how certain music kind of explains the moments of our lives. Um, and you do that in so many different ways, like consistently throughout the book, where whether it's um, using specific songs and then having paragraphs explaining how that, uh, what that means to somebody, as well as just how certain music was the backdrop to a moment. And I was wondering, as you were writing, did you have were you just writing the moment and then you're like oh this song should be playing or did you have the 
music and then wrote the moment around the music? A little bit of both. It was a little bit of both. So music is very important to me. It's something that shaped me in my teenage years. And so it was really fun to write this novel, to have Dava that ex- that same experience and see how the music shaped her into the person she becomes. And so um, the interesting thing for me is um, several years ago, I kind of, in a rash decision, kind of abandoned my entire CD collection that I had since I was a teenager. Because I just felt like, I know, I know. I didn't have a CD player anymore. I'm like, I'm not really listening to it. I wasn't as into music as I was when I was in high school. So I was like, I can, you know, I can move on from all of this. And I regret it. I completely regret it. But when it came time to write this novel, I needed something to listen to as I wrote. And I also wanted to infuse Dava with some of my favorite music. Um, So I started keeping a running list from memory of every album I used to own. And they would go back and listen to them. And then from that, a lot of the music that I listened to when I was younger, I kind of gave that to Dava and had her be shaped by those experiences. And that was just a lot of fun to kind of infuse into her character. What was also really cool is because I won, I always say that Dava is cooler than I am because she's also she's a few years older. Than everyone, she's just that, she's, she's just cooler than everyone. That is a good point. So I also wanted to give her her own musical touchstones and her own memories from her favorite music. So it was a lot of fun to kind of listen to new music or older music that I hadn't really listened to when I was younger and kind of discover new artists through my character. So that was exciting too. Well, I mean, it's fun for me, even as I was rereading this um, last night, just in preparation for this conversation, I found myself scribbling, you know, I didn't want to stop and like go listen to, but anything I hadn't heard or a while or didn't immediately hear in my head, um, you know, it's, this book has the opportunity to open so many avenues of, of music learning, of thinking about um, family. And I, so your audio book, I was reading as I was on your website, I saw on Libro FM, which if y'all don't know about it, and I'll include a link, Libro FM is um, audio books for independent bookstores. And um, I'm a huge fan of it. But you say you have an original song that comes with it. Tell me about this. What is this? So this was a thing I didn't even know I could possibly dream about doing, which is one of the most exciting things about publishing this book is all the other opportunities he gave me that I couldn't even <laughs> envision. So when I was first drafting uh, the novel, I was um, there's a song that plays an important role in this novel. And so as I was writing the lyrics, I, at the time I was also learning the ukulele. So um, I came up with a melody. This melody just sprung to my head for this song, specifically the chorus of this song. So I grabbed my phone and I recorded myself playing this song on the ukulele because I just had this melody stuck in my head. Cut to three years later, it's actually not gonna be published as a book. And the wonderful audio team at Hachette said, uh, we want you to listen to a song for the audio book. What do you think about that? Do you have any ideas? I'm like, I actually have a melody I can share with you. And so they did an incredible job and they took my melody from my, um, my awful performance from my uh, iPhone video clip and they turned it into a full-fledged song and it's amazing and I can't get out of my head. It's super catchy. And it's just a dream. So I, through this novel, I actually helped, sort of helped write a song. And yeah, that's amazing to me still. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm speaking of the, I'm like scrolling down, jumping through my questions because I, I want to ask, you know, today's the, the book birthday. This is a long time coming, um, but the accolades that are coming in, it's so it's a December Indie Next pick, which is a big deal in my world, um, in the independent bookstore world. Um, this means it is front and center, face out, on display in every single indie bookstore across the country. Um, it's a Good Morning America December pick. Um, it's been praised by by the editors of, of some online retailers. It's been parades best 2021 books to gift this holiday season. Um, listed on day beautifuls, non-debut books you should read November and December, Bustle's most anticipated books of November, Goodreads most anticipated books of November, The Washington Post, 15 books to read this fall, Times most anticipated books of fall 2021. I'm reading all of these. The Center for Fiction's first novel prize long list, Publishers Weekly fall 2021 announcements list, and Publishers Marketplace buzz books for fall winter 2021. Like, what does this feel like? 
it's surreal and it's strange. I often think about the fact when you like, this is my third time attempting to write a novel in about 20 years. And so to have this happen now around a debut and I'm over 40, so there's no guarantee of any of the happening. I mean, starting to even be able to publish a book, there's no guarantee. And if you do get to publish a book, that's amazing in its own right, but you're not guaranteed anyone is interest or attention. So I, I, I'm just, it's, I'm gobsmacked all the time that any of this has happened. And I'm so appreciative of anyone who has read the book, such as you and the amazing quote you gave <laughs> when you nominated it for um, in the Indie Next List. Uh, Kimberly said, holy crap, I love this book. <laughs> and just, I, that made my I day. I finished it, it was like 1 a.m. And I immediately was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Everybody, everybody get excited because it's, <laughs> it's that good of a book, but you know, and I, the transition from writing about articles and pop culture, um, you said you've start, you'd written a little bit of fiction before, but it, it wasn't this book, you know, yeah. you do it so well. Every paragraph has, has something else other. It's not just plot points, you know, you're writing about a smell that's happening. You, there's an undercurrent of a description, you know, you use to describe someone's reaction of, of terror, you know, you cut to the grandkids like seeing a terrified raccoon. And so it's, you know, you're painting these images in our mind. I mean, th that's why it's so good. You know, it's just great <laughs> writing. It's a family story, but your writing is, is good. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, how you're coming up with those descriptions, you know, can you talk a little bit, not necessarily about the writing process, but specifically how you're painting these pictures? And uh, I, I guess it's all just so instinctive, I think. I feel, you know, if you're a writer, you're a reader. And that shapes so much of who you are in terms of how you even think of a novel and think about all the very components in terms of character, plot, and theme. You mentioned the raccoon <laughs> as an example. Some of this stuff comes from real life. Um, I was. I was at you know, Central Park with a couple of friends and um, we were actually having a book club meeting and a group of raccoons circled us and it was terrifying <laughs> with that memory stage with all of us. So, you know, those kind of things, the slow things that just stick in your head. So when um, Enzo has that reaction when he sees his grandmother um, have a health issue, I just, you know, you just kind of pull these things from your own life. I don't think about it too much. It's all kind of instinctive, but yeah, everything... I don't think this novel is any way reflection of me and my personal life. I think the one exception, of course, is the music component and how much music means to both me and Dava. But um, that said, that's why it's so much fun to write this novel and just pull little random things from your life without necessarily being about my own, you know, experiences. Well, I, um, once again, I'm jumping through my questions because I loved how the grandchildren are, I mean, your characters are wonderfully drawn, but I loved how you made the grandchildren fully realized characters um, as the novel goes on. And I was wondering if you could talk to that decision. I mean, it makes the book so full and robust and hopeful and reflective of a family gathering because it's not just the adults in the room, you know, it's these humans that are smaller in the room. And I was wondering if you could talk to that decision-making. Um, we won't talk to the plot because it's so good. And I'll read it, you, no spoilers, but just your decision-making around building the kids as full people. And it looks like you might be frozen a little bit. I don't know if I'm frozen or you're frozen. Um, so it looks like you're frozen a little bit. Let's see here. Oh, they're gonna play. Okay, you're back. Okay, we're back. Okay. Let's talk about the grandkids. So I'll start again. All right, so um, the grandchildren were always gonna be a part of this novel, but I didn't know how important it was until I was um, outlining the entire novel. I did a very detailed outline. And one thing I realized is for Daba as a character, she sees her children as an extension of herself where she cannot separate the two. Like she feels, a part of her legacy is how her children are perceived and what they will do to represent her. So I thought it was really important for her to have some more personal and reflective and vulnerable moments to have a conversation with her grandchildren. And that, that connection with them, because she, of course, the younger generation is just an important part of her legacy as her own children, but 
there's a certain just a remove and the fact that they're younger and that she realizes that she doesn't know them as well as she should that lets her open up to them in a very beautiful way. So that came to me as I was outlining um, the novel, but when it came time to write it, it definitely was one of my favorite parts of writing the novel for sure. It's definitely in revisiting. I think I've revisited it twice now. I mean, that is definitely a moment that just sings. Um, you know, we talk about Dava and, and how she views her kids. I mean, she is a very powerful person and you, exhibit that in, you know, very obvious ways, like stating it, but also in kind of small setups to, to show how she exhibits like the power and control, whether it's the way everyone sits with her at the desk and everyone gathered around or the way, explaining the way she's structured um, her, her trusts um, for the kids. And I, I love how you kind of slowly unpack the different ways a powerful person can control the people around them. And um, I was wondering if you could talk to that a little bit. Sure. I mean, one of the things I had to really think about when I first started writing this novel is what kind of person would do something so audacious as leak news of that stuff early to read their obituaries, right? Why would that person do that? And I soon came up with the idea that Daba is a person, because she's a self-made woman, she doesn't have family support. She doesn't have the, the wealth of her husband. She is entirely self-made. And she's very proud of that fact, the fact that she created this amazing business and then became a philanthropist all by herself. And so as part of that pride in herself, she really wants to make sure that her name is synonymous with Rockefeller in terms of being known as, you know, generous and philanthropic, philanthropic and wealthy. And so she really needs to impart that to her children and the only way she knows how to do that is kind of kind of treating them almost as employees as part of her the family business and I don't think the funny thing to me is I don't think Dava would ever realize how controlling she is I mean it's obvious to anyone who meets her especially her family but she just sees it as just running things the way they're supposed to be and for her that means trying to control and shape her children in every which way so they are a perfect mirror of the legacy she's trying to present to the world. I, th I feel like you got it so right. And I was, uh, I was like, who did she interview who's in a family like this? Because it's, it's, it's dead on. Um, and, I, you know, it's just such a great book. It's, it's a family drama. Sorry, I'm getting now to the grandchildren question. Um, but, you know, it's also a guidebook almost about how to be a husband to an ambitious self-made woman. And I, I was wondering if you could talk to me about the motivation or the inspiration or your thoughts around the marriage between Arvid and Dava? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things I wrote uh, maybe a month or two before I started writing this novel, I was rewatching a documentary about a rock star. Um, and in this interview, his widow was speaking about the fact that um, he had cheated on her a lot. <laughs> and um, he didn't seem to care how it affected her. But beyond, besides that, after he passed away, like, she has dedicated her life to upholding his legacy. And it reminded me of Eliza um, and Alexander Hamilton's relationship from the musical Hamilton in real life um, and how she did the same thing. Hamilton famously cheated on her and was very public about his infidelity. And despite that, she forgave him and she dedicated her life to upholding his legacy. And that kind of made me upset because I'm like, you know, if the roles were reversed, their husbands wouldn't have done the same for their wives. They would have just gotten remarried. <laughs> and I was like, that is just not right. So when it came time to think about Dava and her relationship with Arvid, her husband, I wanted to give her someone who completely understood her ambitions, didn't make her feel guilty about it, was completely supportive of her, and understood how she never wanted to be known as the wife of someone. She really wanted to be known for her own identity. And I, that was kind of the core characteristic of the relationship. And it was really fun to write a relationship like that because so often the woman is self-sacrificing and um, is upholding the husband in a relationship. And in this relationship, he was very much, he understood what she was about, never let her, never questioned her about it. And she always felt 110% supported. You know, I, I think this is such a good book club book. And, and a lot of books have the, you know, book club questions and everything else. Uh, but 
the different ways that you explore marriage and the advice that's given back and forth and, and missteps and, and, and um, success stories, I think is, is something that as people read this book and as those of you listening are, are going to really enjoy thinking about um, as, as you go through, through the book. And, you know, I, I'm also curious so her terminal illness is lung cancer that spread. I was wondering, is was there, I mean, anything can kill you. So <laughs> why lung cancer and, and, and why was that the specific choice? That's such a good question. No one's asked me that before, but I wanted to give her something that would spread, quick, spread quickly and that she would decide in the moment because it spread so quickly. There wasn't a lot they could do medically to help her recover her health. Um, as she says in the novel, I could live longer, but what kind of life will it be? I'd kind of be an invalid. So I wanted to give her a diagnosis that, first of all, she could kind of sense that something was wrong. But because her husband had passed away from cancer, she put it off for a long time getting herself checked out. And then what she did, she deemed it too late to do anything significant and decides to make this decision to, because she has a terminal illness, she just feels it's time to me. I will just add my life on my own terms. So that was the reason why. Well, it's, it's such a right now um, conversation, but you set the book in the near, in a little bit of the near future. And I'm scrolling to, to my notes because I want to, I really enjoyed um, the way you presented technology in the near future. And I love, I love that you have this CD regret because um, I, I also have my like VH, I have the last waltz, my VHS last waltz tape that I can't play right now, but I'm never getting rid of. Um, but I, it's the way you use technology in this near future, it's logical, it's not fanciful. You know, you keep the human element in it. And I was wondering um, about your thought process on technology and also your thought process on setting it, you know, just a little bit in the future. It's like, what? 2044? 2044, yeah. So <laughs> I first started writing this novel. Again, I was really writing it for me. I didn't know if there would be an audience for it. I just really want to explore things that were of interest to me. And it was completely intelligent decision because I just wanted to be able to reference the music that I loved. And I also wanted the character at the start of this novel to be an older woman um, and have a, so she could have children and grandchildren. So the only way I could accomplish that is by studying the novel about 20 years in the future so that the run of her 20s and 30s happens pretty much during our current period right now. Um, and so when, in terms of technology, it just kind of became sort of a logical thing because there's no way I can really predict what's gonna happen 20 years from now. I mean, technology has evolved so much over the course of the five, past five, 10 years. So I by setting it on a private island where Daba is a technophobe and therefore her house doesn't have the, the latest gadget, gadgets and gizmos. And then she also has her family not bring their technology either. So they all just are kind of just with each other. That was allowed me to not have to kind of try to predict the future in terms of what we'll be doing 20, 20 years from now in terms of, I don't know, entertainment and communications and everything else. But your, your choices, um felt very honest and, and predictable to me where, yes, we voice activate the shower and um, no, not everyone likes that. Um, you know, I, some of the conversations are around the, in a couple of different ways, families with different skin tones and people's reaction to that and how that affects people and the assumptions, you know, Sandy's, Davos, the, the waiter at, at one point. And um, I wanted to, ask you to talk a little bit about, um, and I'm going to ask you separately about the puja housewarming ceremony, but <laughs> second, but, um, the way our characters go th move through that because the, the family structure has a variety of different skin tones in it. Right. I just think it's a reflection of real life, especially if, um, She's uh, Daba is a first generation Indian American. She was born in this country. She has children and the children marry different people, some Indian and some not. And of course that's gonna be reflective of, there could be a reflective of different cultures and the children, the, the grandchildren be biracial. So I just think for Daba, it just is a reminder to her about how multicultural her whole family is, but somehow how she can also somewhat feel isolated in terms of how 
the world could perceive her and maybe not completely understand, you know, this is my family too, because people are, can be ignorant. So I just want to make sure to be reflective of what many experience, what many people experience um, in the real world. And, and the um, cultural difference, like just, yes, I, you can be Indian and not speak another language, like just, you know, what it means, not even skin tones, but um, cultural identities. And I, you puja the housewarming i mean it's it's like just it's it's only mentioned a little bit but um i wasn't familiar with it just as somebody who's never been to a puja or, or had one and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that just for my own curiosity i'm sure and there's sirens outside so excuse <laughs> that but um in our culture um i grew up a lot we anytime you know a person a family would move into a new house we'd have a blessing uh, a housewarming puja to bless the new house. And, and every time, excuse the sirens, um, as part of this puja, the same story is always told. And, and so it's kind of become a running joke with you know my siblings and our friends who attended so many of these pujas because you do kind of hear that same story. Um, and we, we just attended so many when we were younger. So I just thought it'd be fun to incorporate that uh, into the novel, but also have to be something that's very significant to Daba. Uh, she says she's an atheist. But this is one component that is really meaningful to her to the point that she makes sure that her children have this housewarming puja too. So I just thought it, it's also a good way to show that, like you mentioned earlier, there's no one way to be Indian. And even if she doesn't know her, her, her language, even if she doesn't know her relatives in India, there's a part of her that her Indian heritage is really still important to her and has shaped her. And she wants to make sure to pass that on to her children too. You know, your background is in the pop culture world and commenting on that. And um, especially at the beginning as we're walking into this house and as you're pulling us into the story, which makes everybody have to keep turning the page and and stay in the story. um, We're seeing this huge house in this opulence for the first time through um, Sandy's eyes, who is not blood related to Dava. And I, w- I was wondering if, I mean, if you could talk to, talk about our obsession with celebrity and wealth, um, because you are writing to it and it, it just sucks you in. You want to know how it's built, why it's, you know, the questions just of this level of wealth that, that we're all drawn to and the curiosity, um, same reason why we all need our in Miranda, you know, movies about the musicians um sure yeah i mean part of it's just my background and my interest of course i used to be an entertainment journalist so i had to cover a lot of celebrities and celebrity news and celebrity gossip so i'm kind of well versed in all of that but really it was just an outgrowth of the idea of i had to figure out who dava was as a person and why there would be interest in her in her death beyond the fact that she passed away and the easiest way to convey that and to get the idea that this has become a major news story that lasts longer than a day is to have it be, have her life be attached to a piece of celebrity gossip. But I think of it being sort of like toilet paper stuck to a shoe that she can't quite shake off. So no matter what she's accomplished in her life, she still has this little piece of celebrity gossip that entices people and intrigues people. And so that was a really fun thing to explore. And then social media can also amplify that. Um, now more than ever, we can get a really intimate view of people's famous people's lives, their homes, their children, and once it's kind of Pandora's box. Once you open it, you can't. It's hard to, it's hard to close again. People are really interested and they want to know more, and it's hard to kind of shut that door once you open it. So that was a kind of a lull, the fun things to explore through the character of Dava, and also explore the notion of celebrity and gossip and why people are so interested in it. Um, for those of you who are attending with us live, I do want to let you know that y'all are welcome to um, do any questions in the Q&A or in the chat. I'll monitor both and um, I will ask Karthana about them. And I, my, ne- my next question is, speaking of the pop culture, um, this has been optioned for an episodic drama for TV. So, um, how is that that going? Um, so I'm very excited. I did not expect anybody 
to be interested in turning this into a television series. It's been optioned by Veritas Entertainment. And at the moment, we're exploring our options, trying to find uh, a writer. Um, but it's just exciting because, you know, when I was growing up, I just didn't see myself reflected in TV or film. And so it, it's the idea that this might actually become a TV series that people who um, people like me and people in the younger generation can finally see themselves reflected on screen is amazing to me, especially the idea that the protagonist would be an older Indian American woman, which I don't think has ever, at least been on American television. So it's very exciting to think about. And I, I, I mean, I hope it happens because I just think that would be incredible to see it on, on a small screen. Well, it, yeah, it, an older Indian American woman, a self-made woman, a, you know, everything that she represents is pretty ideal. And Speaking of how she's represented, and you know, I actually, I um, went on your cover designer's web page last night and sent and her contact was there and I sent her an email. I was like, hey, do you want to pop into my in conversation? Uh, because this cover is something really special. I mean, it obviously it came out today. Obviously, we've been hyping the book nonstop all, all around our community. And um but I was watching people come into the store today, immediately see the cover and immediately reach for it. You know, it, it like grab, look, you know, walk around. Walk. When I left to come down here to chat with you, I had a customer walking around with it under her arm, like ready to buy it. And um, can you, on the cover designer's webpage, it had two rejected covers um, as well, which are nowhere near as good as this cover. Can you talk about this process? Because this is really something so special. It's incredible. It's a beautiful cover. And if there's any interest in this book at all, it all starts, I think, with that cover. Um, I gave my ideas. I had no idea what the cover would be. I <laughs> I, um, I, think I mentioned or referenced Phoebe Bridger's uh, latest album cover. It's very kind of melancholy and reflective. And then this is what came back to me <laughs> pretty much. And I was like, oh, that's not what I expected, but it's incredible. And so it's pretty much that's, you know, we did some minor alterations and she took some suggestions, but that's pretty much the novel that came as is. And I just, I'm still, I just feel so lucky to have received such a beautiful cover. Uh, the cover artist, the designer is named Sarah Congdon and she just did a tremendous job. And when that landed in my inbox, I just felt like <laughs> the luckiest person in the world. Yeah, you're like, this is a winner. Um, <laughs> yes. a winner. Um, you know, it really is. And let me monitor to see if anybody has any questions, please feel, feel free to, to include them. Um, I, you bring in Beatrix Potter. I mean, it takes place on Beatrix Island and you have a quote from Beatrix, um, Potter in there. I hope, I, well, I say, I hope, but a strongly marked person can influence descendants for generations. And most of the other quotes that you open up chapters with are within the book. They're a, st a PR statement or a quote from a diary or something else. Where did this Beatrix Potter quote come from? You know, that's such a good question. I have to kind of remember now. I think I think I kind of named Beatrix Island just spontaneously as I was drafting. I'm like, oh yeah, Beatrix Potter, you know, I love the author. So many people love the children's author. And so, um, and then I think I was just, once I came up with this idea, because one of the things that was important to me was like, we, if if Dava is going to leak her death early to read her obituaries, well, we have to see that obituary, right? We have to see first the breaking news obituary, and then we have to see like the whole thing. And then as I thought about that, I'm like, well, it might be a fun idea. Again, a lot of this writing of this novel was indulgent to me and what I was <laughs> enjoy writing. And I thought it'd be a lot of fun to start each chapter with like maybe a social media post or a quote from an article or song lyrics and just kind of way to kind of offer a framing device for what the reader is about to encounter in that chapter. And so I think once I decided to name it Beatrix Island, I was just looking up for different quotations to start that second chapter. And I looked into that amazing quote about descendants and generations. And I just felt like kismet. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Um, but it was just a lot of fun. And I felt it was a good way because so much of the action takes place in this one location. And we don't really leave, in the present day narrative, we never really leave Beatrix Island. Having um, the chapters began with the obituaries or newspaper articles or quotes or diary entries. It was just a way of expanding the world and bringing in another perspective 
to what the reader is about to encounter. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Who also loves the the beautiful cover? It's Mayuri, I believe, and, and I'm apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Um, but the question is: Do you think this is a moment for South Asian writers? I'm so happy to know these stories are being told and not in an entirely typical immigrant story way. I do think that, and one of the most amazing, incredible things about this whole experience as a debut author is meeting other South Asian novelists and getting to know them and getting to read their work and have all our novels reflect the fact that we as an Indians or Indian Americans are not a monolith. We all have different experiences and different ideas and our novels can reflect that. And it's been incredible. I think this is the start of a really great, um, I, I'm losing the word at the moment, but the start of a really great kickoff for South Asian writers and that we won't be pigeonholed in terms of Read our ex expectations that we only cover, um, I don't know, arranged marriages and cultural clashes and things that are kind of expected from South Asian literature. And we're trying to expand what the definition of South Asian literature is. Well, I think I, I love it too. I mean, I, I, I picked up this book, you know, having not, not, not drawn to it because it was an Indian American woman, but because this was like such a cool lady and like, the same reason you're writing. Who does this? Who does this? I have to, and how does this affect her family? And, and I just loved as the, the family dynamics between the adult siblings, as they're grappling with this and grappling with their personal narratives of their family. And, um, I think I felt such honesty in, in the sibling relationships and sibling dynamics as well. And I was wondering if you, cause you said you outlined pretty extensively, if you knew going into it, how those sibling relationships were gonna play out or did that come to you as you were writing? Uh, I figured it out before I even wrote one page of this novel. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this is my third attempt to writing a novel. And the first two novels, I just kind of came up with ideas as I went along. And for me, ultimately, I think that's why they didn't work out. Um, and so for this time, for this novel, I thought, well, this is such a huge family. There's so many characters. Um, I have to kind of think through the relationships before I even start writing the first page. So before I started drafting, along with the outline, I also did a character spreadsheet where I came up with each character, came up with their personality, their quirks, and their arc over the course of the novel, which would also en uh, encompasses their relationship to Dava and how it, you know, it alters throughout the course of the novel and their relationships with one another. And just kind of having that grounding and figuring that out before I even started writing made this whole process a whole lot easier. And I really felt like I knew these characters as I was writing them. Well, it, you it, talking to you now and knowing that this all came, you wrote this for yourself, for your own pleasure and joy, you know, it, that comes through reading it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be inside um, the book. And as, as Mary mentioned, you know, to learn, to learn a little bit about um, Indian culture, to learn, to think a little bit about the future and to think about what it means to be a philanthropist and, and how, how, what's the measure of your life? You know, when you look, are, are you, how, how does, how do you stack up in the end? And um, we have another question um, from Suzanne. Uh, enormous congratulations, Kirthana. I have been waiting for this day and I'm so excited for you. As someone who loves to enter a variety of worlds via reading both fiction and nonfiction, would you please talk about how extensively you research the cultural elements in Dava as a reporter, did interview family, and if so, what was their reaction to your paying attention to their slash your cultural experience for the world to read? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you, Suzanne. That's my professor from Emerson College. Um, love to hear from you. Um, I, I actually didn't do a lot of interviewing. I think I just do a lot about, do a lot on my own experiences growing up in this country, um, Indian American, born and raised, and just the idea of just taking my experiences and kind of grafting that onto Daba, although we're quite different characters because Daba is an only child. I am not she doesn't have any relationship with her extended family, whereas I do. So it was really kind of thinking about who she would be based on how she grew up. And the fact that she grew up in a very small town and she felt very isolated because there weren't a lot of um, 
there was, it was a mostly white town. And so not only did she feel isolated among her peers, but even with the few Indian families she grew up with, she also felt isolated from them. So it wasn't, much, it wasn't so much cultural reportage per se, it was just more about just imagining her particular experience and her specific experience and how that would shape her into the person she is. Um, that said, as I was writing this novel, and it's such a family story, and um, I have my four Shastri person children realize to their horror how little they know about their mother. And they have this realization when they have such limited time left with her. So as I was writing this novel, I received a wonderful lesson, which is I better, you know, learn more about my family too, right? I have to start asking questions and not wait. So I definitely did that. I spoke a lot to my parents, asked them their stories, to my aunts, to my grandmother. So ultimately this book was like a lesson for me too. It was like, oh, I should learn something from these characters and I should start finding out some information too. And it's, it was one of the most joyful and wonderful things to come out of writing this book for sure. And I think everybody who reads it is, I mean, I know, you know, you walk away wanting to ask those questions and, and with realizations of your own as great fiction does. Um, there's another question from Kate. What was the hardest or the most satisfying scene to write? And also, yay, congratulations for exclamations. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, gosh, the hardest scene or most satisfying. Um, you mentioned the last waltz. Um, and so I loved writing the scene that features the last waltz. There's a scene in the novel where Dava has a very memorable Thanksgiving with her husband. Well, it starts off a little rocky, but then he becomes very memorable and incorporates the last waltz. And then it's a, the last waltz, if you haven't heard of it, it's a documentary about the band. The band's name is actually called The Band. And it's about the final concert that they ever have together before breaking up. And it's this wonderful documentary that features all these awesome performances. And it's a documentary I learned about and I watched um, before starting this novel. So I kind of got to um, incorporate my love of the documentary and the one song I, and there's one song in particular that plays an important part in this scene. And so it was really fun to write that because it was kind of like taking my real time love of discovering something and fusing that into Dava who also in real time discovers how much she loves something too. And then the Lost Watts kind of kind of plays an important role in the novel in terms of how she figures out how she's going to shape her legacy in her final moments with her family. So that was definitely one of my favorite scenes to write. The the music Easter eggs that go on throughout the book um, are are such a treat, as we mentioned earlier. And as I was rereading it last night, um, I realized there's one David Grohl shout out. And you know, this book coming out right now, his book is is flying off the shelves, reprinting everything else. And I'm, um, I know today you've been doing a lot of social media. I wonder if you've uh, social media connected with him. So over, over the shout out and, and all being big books right now. You know, I didn't even think of that, but maybe I should. I heard his book is amazing and I know it's a bestseller, but maybe, maybe I will be like, by the way, you're by the way family drama. Well, it's, it's, uh, it, it's fun to um, explore all the possibilities of connection that you've given us through music um, in the book. And I, as we, if anyone else has any more questions, please, please let me know. And um, I, I was wondering if you wanted, I, Stephen Sondheim, I'm so sorry about my pronunciations, um, the Broadway, um, writer you know you talked you recently tweeted about his death and I was wondering if you could talk to that um because it just uh, echoes a little bit of your your plot as and I was wondering if you could talk to that a hundred percent it was actually kind of surreal that that happened just a couple of days ago because again all, the inspiration for writing this novel was my experience as an entertainment journalist and as part of that role I had to cover any time a celebrity passed away you know, that could include writing obituaries or other articles related to their death. And as part of that coverage, you have to be uh, attuned to social media react reaction and the outpouring of grief and shock. And then, so it was interesting to me to suddenly feel that same way, you know, when I experienced that. It's not often when a celebrity death, you know, kind of impacts me, but this one did, even though 
Sanham is 91 years old, so it shouldn't have been too much of a surprise. At the same time, he's a towering figure of American musical theater and so important to so many people. So it was kind of interesting to experience my own shock where I felt like I was so shocked and devastated in the moment. I even felt I had to jump on social media and say something, which is not normal for me. I usually don't do that, but that's how much he meant to me. And just kind of see that outpouring again of people who loved him so much and connected with his music so much as I did too. But just a reminder <laughs> what inspired this novel. It was just very interesting that that happened a few days ago. Well, it, it was a treat. Is is there anything else you know, you want um, to talk about as we're discussing this novel on on the um, book birthday? Um, as as we keep talking, or or some a story you want to share about writing the book, or anything I have should have asked about but didn't think to. Gosh, um, I just think. This is a novel. One of the fun things about this novel is that it's set between Christmas and New Year, that time when it's kind of a downtime in terms of all of us are kind of taking a deep breath. There's not a lot happening. And we're also spending time with our families at this time usually. So I figure if you're interested in reading this novel and uh, if it piques your interest, this might be a good time because it's definitely reflective of that interesting time of year. Where we're all kind of slowed down, become reflective. A new year is coming up and more often than not we're with our loved ones and so much of this novel is about all the characters kind of taking a halt to their very busy lives and realizing how much their family means to them because they get to spend time with each other in this very profound way so um yeah that's what i would like to <laughs> share about this book this might be good reading right now as we enter the holidays and we could start a new year well i just want to thank you so much for writing this book it as much fun as I know it was for you to write it is such a pleasure to read it's it's going to be a treat for me to hand to people in the store and over and over and over again and um I before I end it here I realized I did not put the link to buy the book from the bookshop in our chat which is like very important um <laughs> And I want to encourage all of y'all to get this book, to read this book, to, um, I'm going to also include a link to Libro FM to listen to this book so we can all hear your song um, and, and also to, to support your independent bookstores. Um, bookstores, at, especially at Christmas time, you know, when you walk into a bookstore, you may be going in to get like a book for your eight-year-old nephew, but walking through a physical bookstore, you never know what's going to pop off the shelf and catch your eye and and just all the little rabbit holes of discovery that can happen when you're walking through a bookstore and bookstores only exist literally only because you choose to shop in them so um at this time of year especially i encourage you to get this incredible book from an independent bookstore any independent bookstore and um i want to thank you so much for writing it again it's a treat and thank you for chatting with me on book launch day thank you so much thank you so much for your, your support and your bookstore support and i reiterate everything you say buy local shop local support your independent bookstore for sure thank you thank you so much bye guys bye